The back cover of this book is wrong. It says a suspect is a cafeteria worker with a major grudge. There's no such character in the book. It also confuses Laura with an unnamed psychic. It's like whoever wrote the cover summary didn't read the book. Argofon book review, Argofon book review. In the throwaway mystery, the Hardys jump off a moving train to an abandoned subway station. They learn that a kidnapped skateboarding star is being held hostage in a building which will explode in 10 minutes. Instead of telling the demolition crew to stop, Frank and Joe rush into the building themselves. They disable as many bombs as they can and save the skateboarder just in time. This is a great preview of the high-level action scenes that will not be seen in this book. Atak hides a mission disc inside a pumpkin at a haunted house. As always, that's a terrible hiding spot. They are lucky nobody else found it first. Today's mission is at a youth prison called Undercliff House of Detention. Two inmates named Mariyama and Gregory died here. The cause of death is unknown, but it looks like they died from fear. They died screaming with fear hormones in their bloodstreams. The prison looks like a tombstone. People think it's haunted because it used to be an insane asylum. Throughout the entire book, the Hardys find journal entries from a former inmate named Moses. He's slowly losing a fight against insanity. These notes are legitimately scary. It's like something out of Edgar Allan Poe. The head guard is Micah Neal, who does pretty much everything. The prison is run by Dr. Elton Beerley, a strange psychiatrist. He gives Frank a weird series of interview questions. Beerley openly admits the prison is haunted, but he hired a psychic to cleanse the building after the inmates died, so he figures it's all good now. Beerley does not sound like the kind of person who should be in charge of a teenage prison. We get our first haunting when Joe sits on a chair. He gets cold. Cold spots are proof of ghosts! Uh. The Hardys meet the various prisoners, like Robert the Streaker. Harlan was arrested for elaborate pranks, so he has the ability to fake a haunting. Danny is a science nerd. Like Harlan, he might have killed the victims to increase his chances of getting a scholarship. Maggie isn't a prisoner, but she might as well be because she hangs out with them all the time. She's cute, so we get the usual jokes about cute girls love Frank and they don't like Joe. Laura believes the ghost is real. She says ghosts always appear in places where there is intense, prolonged suffering, like high school. Laura convinces everyone to have a seance to contact a ghost. I'm not sure it's accurate to say this place is a prison. There aren't any jail cells. Kids are allowed to do pretty much whatever they want, whenever they want, outside of mandatory activities like baking cookies. Also, the Hardys walk around with knives at all times, that's not how prisons work in real life. Late that night, everyone sneaks into a chapel. The door is locked and they have to pick it. That means this unused room has more security than the girls' dorm. Laura makes them sit in a circle and light candles. They all start chanting when a female ghost appears in the mist. A girl named Cindy panics because she thinks it's the ghost of Iris. Who? Iris Edwards. She was a prisoner here who died under mysterious circumstances. Her death was later ruled a suicide. I have to wonder why ATAC did not include any information about her in the mission briefing. I mean, ATAC sent the Hardys here to investigate three deaths, so why did they only tell the Hardys about two of them? It seems like a deliberate failure on ATAC's part. The Hardys have trouble avoiding the guards when going back to their room. Oh sure, now there are guards. Frank and Joe argue over whether or not the ghost is real. They realize Maggie is setting off smoke bombs, and they learn people have attacks of claustrophobia in the library. Joe checks the internet. It says the notes from Moses are fakes. Nobody named Moses has ever been here before. Again, something ATAC should have mentioned in their briefing. The Hardys find Danny dead in the library. 
They revive him with CPR and a defibrillator. The Hardys do some solid detective work for once, as they explore the library. Joe finds a sound system built into a hollow book, while Frank finds a hidden entrance to the ceiling, which the culprit uses to pump the room full of strange gas. That's how the culprit induced Danny's heart failure. The Hardys here beerily threaten Micah, and Laura decides to have another seance. Frank sneaks into the room ahead of time so he can see how Laura fakes the ghost illusion. She uses a fog machine, a tape recorder in her shoe, and a holographic 3D projector. For a prisoner, she has access to some pretty amazing technology. Laura is Iris's cousin. The entire thing is an elaborate setup on her part to locate Iris's killer. It's pretty extreme that Laura got herself arrested in order to fake a seance in order to guilt trip a murderer into confessing. What was Laura's backup plan if that didn't work? Joe searches Micah's office. It turns out that Micah is an ex-con. Beerly is blackmailing Micah by threatening to lie to his parole officer. Even worse, Beerly doesn't know the difference between it's and it's. How could he use bad grammar like that? Joe solves the mystery when he reads another note from Moses. It has bad grammar, so clearly it was written by Beerly. Beerly is the culprit. He has a theory that crime and fear are inversely linked. That is, he thinks if he scares the prisoners enough, they'll stop being criminals. He's literally trying to scare them straight. That's why he faked all the hauntings and trapped kids in rooms with fear gas. He was experimenting on them for his fear theory. I have to say, this culprit sounds a lot like the Scarecrow from Batman. Joe hits Beerly with a chair, and he saves Frank from toxic gas. Beerly is arrested, and there's a spooky ending where they all see the ghost of Iris. The end. Post-book follow-up. This book is okay. I thought the ghost stuff was a little tame and not very scary, but it's definitely scary enough to work as a ghost story book for younger readers. I suspect this book was originally going to be Super Mystery Number 3 before it got this scary makeover. It came out in between books 23 and 24. It's a little weird they published a spin-off book in the middle of a trilogy, yeah? It's the last standalone mystery they published for the Undercover Brothers. Everything else after this is part of a trilogy. I wonder if the first chapter was written by someone else. The writing style is slightly different. The author goes overboard with snarky one-liners and pop culture references. It feels like they're desperate to appeal to younger readers. The proofreading in this book is not good. Chapter 12 is incorrectly labeled as a Joe chapter. There's a mistake where Frank says, I told him, in back-to-back -back sentences, and a mistake where Robert's name is accidentally reused, making it so he asks and answers his own question. The pacing is slower than it needs to be, which I didn't like, but it's extra long, which I did like. I think the biggest problem is that the Hardys spend too much time trying to figure out everyone's motive. That takes up the majority of the book. Indeed, two suspect profiles appear after page 137, which is 75% of the way through. At that point, the Hardys should be eliminating suspects, not adding them. Not to mention, over half the suspects weren't here last year when the first victim died. The Hardys shouldn't have spent so much time on people who couldn't be guilty. Despite my many complaints, this is probably a standout book for the series. I can't think of any other book which is scarier than this one, so it definitely achieves its goal of being a spooky Halloween version of the Undercover Brothers series. In that sense, it's a big success. I give Hardy Boys Undercover Brothers Haunted an 8 out of 10.